So yet another Orange Pi board called the PC2. It's sporting the new 64-bit quad-core all-winner H5 MCU. Is this really a good idea? So to help me with my workload, I decided to train up my better half on how to use video editing software. So then you just click on... Oh, what am I looking at? When does this happen in the video? Now. You're looking at now. Now. Everything that happens now is happening now. What happened to then? We passed then. When? Just now. You're looking at now. Now. Go back to then. When? Now. Now? Now. I can't. Why not? We missed it. When? Just now. When will then be now? Soon. As you'll find out in this video, things aren't always what they seem. Let's see if we can count the number of issues with this board. So here we have the brand spanking new Orange Pi PC2. This is one of the very few boards to be running the new all-winner H5 MCU. The H5 is a pretty impressive chip running a 64-bit quad-core Cortex-A53 with floating point unit and also the Mali 450 which is a 6-core GPU. It should leave skid marks on your desk but as we'll find out later there are some issues. It has other cool stuff like an array of memory interfaces, three SD or MMC controllers, high-speed timers, RTC, 12 DMA channels, PWM, temperature sensor, which is actually critical these days on fast CPUs, spin locks, crypto engines, UARTs, SPIs, I2C, essentially everything you'll need in a common garden variety small MCU these days. So what do we have on this Uber board from Orange Pi? Starting from the top right, working clockwise. One USB 2 port, gigabit ethernet, another two USB ports, composite video out, onboard mic, HDMI, UART console, 5 volt 2 amp DC jack, power button, MIPI CSI, USB OTG, almost standard Pi GPO header, infrared receiver, and there's also the RTL8211 ethernet chip, 1 gig DDR3 RAM, SY8106 PMIC, SPI NOR Flash, and of course the all winner H5. On the flip side, there's just a bunch of passives and the SD slot. Finding the right OS image to use is, of course, a bit hit and miss. They have a decent quick start guide, which is a little dated, but you can follow it easily enough. I wanted to try several images out Android, which I can actually download from Google Drive. And if you spend a bit of time searching, you'll also find an official Linux image that's a bit more recent. So I fetched Ubuntu Xenial. I also fetched Arbion, even though there isn't an official image for it yet. Wrote it to an SD card using Etcher, and chucked it into the SD slot. Then spent the next five minutes looking for it on the floor somewhere, and finally putting it back in again. Then of course there was the usual keyboard and mouse, Ethernet, HDMI, and my testing hard disk on the second USB port. Don't be tempted to power it up using the micro USB because you won't be able to. Just use the DC jack. Then finally power it up. You'll see a Linux desktop in around 30 seconds. I did have a bit of trouble getting it going with my Elgato HD recorder but managed to coax it into action. When I actually tried to start using the desktop things went downhill even further. This is a recording of me trying to open up just a basic terminal. It's uh, sped up by a factor of three, so I don't bore you. Man, that's a world record for sluggishness. If you have no display, check your router for a DHCP IP address. Log in and go through the usual Arbion configure script. The H5 MCU has dynamic frequency scaling, which we can access from the Linux slash sys interface. You have ranges from 120 megahertz all the way up to 1.3 gigahertz. You also have access to the MCU temperature sensor. The H5 is very similar to the Pine 64 and we'll find out later how it performed in comparison to that. As of this video release, Armbin was running kernel version 4.10. One other nice aspect of this kernel version is the statistics on how long the CPU spends in the various frequency speeds. In all my tests, I log as much as possible so I can correlate the data. On Arbion-based OSs, I use SOCAT to redirect the output of Arbion Monitor 
so that I can log it from my Mac. It's a very simple way of logging without running the risk of losing any data. So, onto some basic GPIO tests. We seem to have an I2C, UART and sound device files, but no infrared or SPI. Hmm, interesting. There's also the onboard LEDs. Yeah, they work okay. Moving on. And of course, the keyboard LEDs work. No surprises there. The PC2 is almost identical to the Plus2, but for a couple of changes. There are a couple of differences in GPIOs. Going through the schematic, I discovered that there was PD11, PC5 and PC6. I went through and double checked them all, and yep, they were indeed connected. Next onto I2C testing. I installed the missing I2C tools package and found one of the I2C buses, but not the others. There should be more than one. There was only one device on this bus, which turned out to be the PMIC. So, this was bus 0, but none of the other buses were there. Just to confirm, I hooked up my I2C based temperature sensor. Unfortunately, the I2C bus hasn't been enabled, and all I was able to do was just use that pin as a normal GPIO. So I dumped the device tree database and searched for the I2C definition, which it turns out was disabled. So I enabled for both buses, saved the database and rebooted. Ah, but no dice. Clearly there's a lot of work still to do. It's starting to look a lot like the Pine 64. Ah, good grief. The same can be said about the SPI bus. There's one there, but that's for the SPI flash. I tried enabling it in the device tree database, but once again, nope. However, there's a bunch of UARTs on board. I attached my logic analyzer to it, wrote out some appropriate text, and yes, yay, it works. Uh, what about sound? Nope, sorry, not working there either. So clearly, I think I need to try another OS here. Oh, by the way, powering off the PC2 is a bit hit and miss. Sometimes it does, and sometimes it doesn't. Murphy's Law kicked in here, and I never managed to get a recording of the not powering off state. However, if it does power off successfully, you can't power it back on again. So then I tried the official image to see if it would work any better. Seemed to boot up without issue, going well so far. But we're running an older kernel version, and no ITC, SPI, or infrared. Man, this is abysmal. However, the audio devices are there. So does the onboard mic work? Well, apart from the noisy fans on my desk, the audio quality is actually pretty good. Hey, look at that. And we seem to have access to all the dynamic frequency scaling on the MCU, even better. I tried enabling SPI in the device tree, but nope. Okay, I've had enough of this. Something has to work on this board. Let's try the Android image. We might have better luck with that. Okay, so booting up was pretty quick and... Okay... Um, okay, maybe clicking here. Okay, that looks like a dialog box. And the left side is usually an OK button. Uh, um, right? Ah, oh, forget it. Moving back to Arbion, I started doing some performance tests which actually was doing extremely well for TCP throughput at close to the theoretical limit. And UDP jitter was very low as well. Nice that something works well. So before I start bashing this board with performance tests, I need to attach my Uber heatsink somehow. So a bit of electrical tape and my patent pending aluminium heatsink transfer thingies will do the job. There we go. Suitable for my testing, but not for anything else. Powering up the board showed a marked drop in temperature when idle, moving from the 65 degrees average down to around 37 degrees Celsius. So, after a couple of days of testing, the results are in. As expected, the PC2 matched the Pine 64 on performance fairly closely. There were a few surprising variances, such as with John the Ripper and parallel BZIP compression, but all in all, it was a close match. Note that these tests were performed with my Uber heatsink on the PC2, whereas the Pine64 had no heatsink at all. So the Pine64 had some pretty decent thermal dissipation. The PC2 is a pretty speedy board, being faster than all the Orange Pi and NanoPi boards I've tested so far. 
For comparison, I wanted to see how it would perform without the Uber heatsink, and just with a small fan and copper heatsink. I ran the small PT test again, as this test pushed the temperature to the max with the Uber heatsink. Using just that small copper heatsink saw the test move from 811 seconds to 1031 seconds, a 27% drop in performance. So the bigger the heatsink, the better. You can find all this data on the openbenchmarking.org website or my website. I have to say this was the most troublesome board I've looked at so far. Well, there's always the Pine64, but at least that had a working Android iOS. Halfway through my testing, I was actually thinking of just putting up an 8 minute video with the words, forget it. I'm not even going to bother writing this one. At this stage, there's just so many things that aren't working. I have a strong feeling it's going to go the same way as the Pine64. The H5 is actually a pretty decent chip, but all winner aren't being helpful at all with data. So it's probably going to die a slow death. Shame really, as this board could be a real doozy. Anyway, thanks for watching and see you next week.